Hello, please. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Okay. Good morning, sir. I hope we are all doing well. We are fine. Thank you. All right. So I'm I'm happy to meet you this morning. Yeah, good, good sir. Morning. Okay, so please, can we start or should we wait on? Please, let's start. So, this morning, we want to take our first lesson on the principles, theories, and practice of education, specifically military education. And uh, last week, we looked at the course content, what we are expected to learn by the end of the semester. So today, we'll try our best to start with the chapter one. So before we start, it's important to know whether I can see about 619 people here. Okay, that's great. So today, our course objectives, I want us to start with our course objectives. By the end of the lesson, we are expected to know the following. Um, we're good to go. So this, uh, can you see from the, can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So today, we want to look at four main objectives for this particular lesson. So by the time we finish the lesson, every student is expected, one, to list the three main theories of teaching and learning. <laughs> So there are, there are theories of teaching and learning. And in this lesson, we want to look at the three main theories. So here, I'm just saying that you should be able to mention them one, two, three. And then when we are done with the lesson, we now want to look at how to describe these three main theories. At least a little description of the three main theories of teaching and learning. And uh, as we are in the approach and we are practicing, we want that you should be able to practicalize these theories. So the third objective entreats us to mention at least three practical applications of each of the theories of learning. So as you are working with at the AC unit, at the labor unit, the postnatal, we want you to be able to give three examples under each of the theories of learning so that you understand how they relate to your practice. So that we are not learning with vacuum, but you understand that these theories relate to your nursing and military work that you've been doing. And it's important for us to look at each of them. Then the last thing we want to look at will be to demonstrate understanding of the practical application of the descriptive cognitive model by Robert Gann. So one of the models is called the descriptive cognitive theory or model. 
And in this, our lesson, we want us to be able to describe the steps. There are steps in the descriptive cognitive model. And in describing each of these steps, we will take each step and see how it relates practically to the work that you are doing. And, and this is important. I, 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 it is my hope that by Sorry, the way, no, no. please. No, no. Uh, no, no. Uh, so these are the objectives that we should please for me, please for me. Nako Pampersna. Madam Precious, we are learning. Yeah, yeah, we understand. Okay. So please let's look at the objectives and let's follow the objectives accordingly. So that at the end of the day, you understand whatever that we have learned and you know what to practice for and to keep yourself abreast. Because the questions will be coming from the objectives. So let's go to the main lesson. So theories, principles, and practice of teaching and learning. So the lecture one, as I already said, we are going to look at the theories of teaching and learning. Yeah. Now, in this lesson, my objective is not to describe what theory is or to give you long definitions, but it's just to help you understand in simple terms whatever that we are going to do. So let's look at this. Please, let's look at this. Can you see the theories of learning? Yeah. So basically, the first objective is that we want to look at the, the three theories of learning. And on the screen, you can see there are three. The red one, the red one, refers to the theories of learning. Then it points to three other, three other terms that we have seen. So these three theories of learning, they are conditioning theory, the cognitive learning theory, and then the social learning theory. So conditioning theory, cognitive learning theory, and then the social learning theory. Now, specifically, I will break each of these theory to the main theory I want us to look at. So when we talk about conditioning theory, specifically, what is the name of the theory? When we talk about cognitive theory, specifically, what is the name? And when we talk about social learning theory, what is a specific name that we are referring to? So specifically, this is what we are referring to. The conditioning theory is referred to as a behaviorist theory or behaviorism. So conditioning, what are we conditioning? What, what are we conditioning in the human being? We are conditioning the behavior of a human being. That is what we are referring to. So that's why it's called the what, the what learning theory. So it focuses on observable and measurable behaviors. So we have our clients. And these clients that we have at our various websites, when they come for our service, they exhibit, they exhibit various behaviors. And these behaviors, we can observe them. 
and some of them we can measure them. So the behavior. Please, please mute yourselves. Mute yourselves. Please. Uh, please go. That's fine. So we are saying that the behaviorist theory or the behaviorism, we are looking at what and what refers to behavior. And what is behavior? Behavior is observable and measurable. Now, the second one, we talk about the cognitive theory. So the cognitive theory is referred to as cognitivism. So cognitivism, cognitive theory. And cognitive theory is from the brain. We are talking about the human brain. So it deals with that how, how. How is it that People behave the way they behave. So, how do you learn as students? How do you learn? You all have different learning methods. So, how do you learn? How do you organize your brain to learn? And then the why? The why is the constructivism that the social learning children. So the social learning theory specifically is called the, cost, the constructivism theory. That's the why. So the why is about in society, we are looking at the role that the learner plays. How do you learn a behavior? And why do you adopt certain behaviors? Why do you adopt certain good behaviors and certain bad behaviors? Construct. Construct means that to develop your own way of behaving. Now, this will, we now want to look at specific theories. And then we will look at specifically how we can relate them to our normal way as nurses and midwives. So the behaviorist practical. Let's look at the behaviorist. How do we apply it at our website? So behaviorism, because it's about behavior, behavior can be improved using two main methods. We have a positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. So what we are saying is that for a behavior to occur, we can reinforce it. We can reinforce the behavior to occur or not to occur. So positive reinforcement is about making sure that a behavior occurs in a positive way or in a way that we call design. So let's look at the, our, the way that we are doing. What are some of the practical ways that positive reinforcement can occur? So at our websites, those are the AC unit. We have realized that we want to encourage AAC attendance. Particularly, we want to encourage males to participate in AAC attendance. So what do we do at our facilities to ensure that husbands start with their wives for AAC attendance? What do we do at our facility to ensure that husbands start with their 
Pour des awal pour et c'est à tel place. Can I get some hands? What do you do at your facility? To be sure that the advance can win. Yes, Jane, what do you do? So what I do in my facility that when I have an account with a wife, we give a reference to them. So we tell the other client that because this client came with a husband, so we need to take care of that client first before we see to her. Okay. That's what we do. Okay, that's good. I have any other person that on you and talk. What do you also do? Do you do something different? What specific thing do you do? Oh. Sir. Yes. Sir, we involve the husband in taking care of the pregnant woman so that they can help them when they go home. Okay. Great. Any other person, what, what do you do different to ensure male involvement? Yes, please, you can unmute and talk. Hello, sir. Good morning. Okay. Sir, good morning. Please, good morning. Yeah, so we normally do that because we sometimes give them the education. So we also, if they, they are, they have Sir, good morning. Okay, we also listen to the education that we normally give it to the pregnant women. Uh, it also helps a lot. So, and sometimes to, when they bring, uh, if uh, a a different person is in with the husband. It also encourages the other midwives and other pregnant women to also bring DS so that we will look after them earlier if maybe they want to go somewhere. Uh -huh. That's it. But most important thing is about the education that we normally give it to the, the pregnant women. We also want the husband to also be involved in the education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I've seen. So some hands can read. All right. So please uh, let's uh, le let's continue. Our when we go ahead, you have the opportunity to also participate. Yes. So it is a behavior we want to reinforce, and it is a positive behavior. We want to encourage males to come to the facility with their wives. So it's a positive reinforcement that we like it. It is a behavior we all cherish as health workers. And we want it to keep occurring. I want it to keep occurring. So that is why we ensure that we do all we can to promote male involvement uh, in ASC attendance. So it's a behavior and a behaviorism, but it falls under positive reinforcement. Then you can also see that uh, one way to encourage the pregnant women when they come is also give them mosquito nets. So it's a service that we render when they come. Giving out of mosquito nets is important, and we know the importance as in pregnancy. And the uh, research. Research have shown, I think last, uh, the 400, your seniors who completed, I supervised one of, one of the groups that did the research on the mosquito nets. And the, their data analysis have shown that at hospitals where they do mosquito nets, it encouraged the ASC attendance of the women. So it is a positive behavior that we have to look at. That for adequacy of AC attendance, we need to look at some of these things. How do we ensure that the AC that the women come for is adequate? So one of it is service provision, which is about giving out of mosquito nests. Uh, is anybody have an example when, when you have an experience of Given out of mosquito nets and how it either influence your client from coming. You have any practical experience that giving of mosquito nets actually 
influence their community facility. Any any person who has the practical experience to share with regards to giving up mosquito nets. Any practical sharing with mosquito nets. Do you think that mosquito nets will improve AC attendance? Yes, Esther. Esther, you can talk. Hello, Esther, I can see you. Oh, you can talk. Hello, sir. Good morning. Good morning, please. Okay. We also do uh, to our to we also involve the men um, in taking care of their wives, especially listening to the FH. Okay. After participating, you allow them to listen to the FH and they feel very happy. Wow. So that's the different thing that I think we also do in our facility. That encourage the men to come with their wives during antenatal. Okay. What about the mosquito? Do you have an experience with the mosquito? Do you think that it encourages participation? The mosquitoes. No, even of mosquito nets. Yeah, we give, but that's uh, when the person comes for her first antenatal, her first okay. visit. That's okay. where we, we initiate the. Uh, Mosquito net and then give education on malaria and all that. The SP will be going to give to her or when he get when it gets to sixteen weeks, we explain that to her. But it all takes place during her first encounter with us. Oh. But after that, when the husband also comes with her, we will still give that education so that the husband will help her out with it so that even if they get home it will the, the husband can just remember the wife it's time it's six o'clock so you have to go and sleep or you have to yes. get inside to prevent yourself from getting malaria okay. that, that is great thank you okay, thank you so aside the giving of mosquito to okay Two people have raised their hands. Yes. Please, you have to talk again. Yes. Please talk. Why then? Sir, good morning. Please, good morning. Uh, uh, please, what uh, I had with the mosquito net, uh, I, what I realized was, one day I had a client who came uh, from a different facility, but she didn't make it known that she had already gone for it. Okay. Then she came empty handed. We registered and gave the next. So when she came the second time, then uh, she said that this place, you are doing well. When we come, you attend to us well, you give us our notes. Then you tell us what, where, uh, where we have our pregnancy has reached so far. So I said, ah, why are you saying that? She took, then she told me that she went to the public and then picked her card. Then uh, the woman, the, the midwife didn't give her a net. So when oh. she went the second time, she asked the midwife her net. And the midwife argued with her that she has given her the net. Why is she lying? So she stopped going there. So I said, ah, is it this pregnancy or previous one? She said, this pregnancy. I said, she should go and bring me the cat. So she went back, brought the cat. So what I did was I copied my attendant into her book, the, the, the previous one. Then uh, clean the, uh, I gave her registration number, what I gave to her in my facility to a different client. Then I continued with my other midwife's registration. Then I told her that for the next, she should keep it. In case an uh, auditor come, I can explain that, oh, I gave it to somebody because of maybe a disaster or something, so she should keep it. So she was very happy and said, uh, uh, to be frank, she needed a net. But the midwife, uh, uh, the way the midwife spoke to her, she didn't like it. So that was the reason why she stopped uh, uh, going to that place. And since 
she she just uh, I did that to her every month. She comes for her AAC service, and she even delivered the at our place. So I realized that giving them the name was something good to them, and it also helped them to attend AAC service. Okay, thank you so much, Maida. Thank you, Maida. Thank you, so uh, this is good. Since we know that uh, these are ways that we can do to ensure that there's positive reoccurrence of the behavior. And the behavior here we are looking at is attendance, attendance, attendance at ANC or speaking of health service. Yeah. That's the behavior we are looking at. So, so another way to also make sure we promote good behaviors is the availability of essential immunizations. So the availability of essential immunizations is important. And and we know that when these women they come, please, please unmute. Please unmute. Please, Sister Justin, mute yourself. Sister please. Patient, please mute yourself. Okay, thank you. So we know that giving up immunization is a determinant. And if it's time, if it's, they come six weeks, they come 10 weeks, and they don't have the immunizations, it will reduce their speaking of health services. And if you can remember, I think last year, is it last year or early this year? Last year, there was a nationwide stoppage of immunization. Most of the essential immunizations were not available at, across most of the facilities. And I want you to share with me: was there was there a decrease in your attendance when there was the shortage of the immunizations last year across the country? Did you experience any decrease? of the services that you provide because the immunizations were not there. Who can give me your facility? What happened when the immunizations were not there? Were the women coming? Share with us what happened at your facility last year when there was shortage of immunizations. Yeah. So yeah, Frida, Frida, please share with us what happened. Okay, um, the immunization didn't really affect the attendance, but rather when um, the facility was not having the routine ANC medication. Okay. Uh, that's what really affected the attendance. So what I've realized is that when um, the drug switch is covered by insurance, you are not having it, uh -huh, it tends to affect um, attendance and let's say when um, you have issue with your scan machine too that one to affect attendance that's what i've realized all right that is great any other hello floods oh okay sir for the immunization yes. it actually didn't affect um uh, maternity coverages per se but when you look right. at the zero to five man that is a child welfare clinic you realize that it has actually reduced the immunization coverages. And then okay. based on that, once the child is, is due for immunization, then the immunization is not available, meaning the mother too is not bringing the child to the child welfare clinic. So it has actually decreased the uh, immunization, the percentage rate of the immunization and then attendances as well. But for okay. the maternity side, it didn't actually affect because we don't do much of immunization to the pregnant women apart from the TD that we give. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. You are welcome. All right. 
So, so these are all ways that uh, we have to look at it as we are working. You have yet mentioned some of them. How do we ensure that essential services are available? Essential services are available so that it will promote the active of these services by this way. And because what to what to change their behavior and the behavior we're working at is I want them to come for the services that we are giving out to them. Then rather than reducing waiting time, it will reducing waiting time at AC versus is also a positive behavior. So if a woman comes and the woman spends two hours, two hours, probably the next time the woman might be hesitant to come because she will look at the time she wasted the last time and might not be willing to come again. But imagine the woman comes and within 15 minutes, within 15 to 30 minutes, you attend to this woman then it means that you are reducing the waiting time. And in doing that, you promote, when they go home, they will tell their colleague women that, hey, now they a sick change. And you have realized that when you reduce waiting time, they begin to tell others that now there is a change. When you go, you don't waste time. Uh, so they are able to leave their, their children at school. They are able to leave their work. They are able to leave their shops and then they are able to come and go fast. So it's important that we look at reducing the waiting time at AC places. So these are some of the positive ways that we can reinforce the behavior of our clients. Uh, there are others, there are others that you can also add. So some some also mentioned the the availability of the routine. AC drugs, which is important. They are a bit of private scan machine. There are so many of them you can mention that can promote the uptake of our services. Now, another way you can also reinforce behavior. Uh, please, please mute, mute. Uh -huh, so another way to also look at behavior is through negative reinforcement. So negative reinforcement, we also want to promote a good behavior, but in a negative way or in a way that is not pleasant. In a way that the person is not happy that we are using that particular method. Please, please, I ask you to unmute. Please unmute. Yes, yeah, somebody sign it, sir. Nadia, you hand it, sir. Hello, Nadia. Nadia, you hand it, sir. Please go, go ahead. Yes, please go ahead. Oh, you can talk. Nadia, you have a piece of meat and talk. All right, for sure. There might be some mistake. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. So we are saying that in negative reinforcement, we also want to promote a behavior. But in promoting the behavior, we rather apply an unpleasant stimulus. And unpleasant stimulus, but this unpleasant stimulus is to bring about a good behavior. We want the behavior to okay, but we apply 
an adverse or an unpleasant stimulus to still promote the behavior to occur. So looking at it from our various websites, after the labor world, we all know that during childbirth, uh, when the baby said has crowned, and you can see that crowning has taken place, we expect your hope is that the woman will push so that this baby will come out without any asphyxia or asphyxiating. So if you see that their head is fully crowned and the woman had them go to push it or the woman is reluctant to push it, you as midwives, we apply a negative force. We apply something that is not pleasant. Which, which though is not accepted, but it's to promote intrauterine death, or it's to promote, is to, 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 sorry, to prevent intrauterine death. So we have to do it. We, we, sometimes you beat, sometimes you shout, just to ensure that the woman pushes and the baby comes out alive. Now, the good behavior here is that you want the child to survive. That is a good behavior. But in promoting the child to survive, you apply an unpleasant stimulus on the woman, which is beating or shouting. The woman will not like the beating. The woman will not like the shouting. So that makes it negative. But at the end of the day, it leads to a positive behavior, a positive outcome. So that's what I call a positive, negative rate of now, in another circumstance, when we have heart emergencies, and we have heart emergencies, so if there's a cardiac arrest, and uh, one of the ways to ensure that the heart comes back to life is, 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 is by giving some kind of electric shock. Uh, so we have to measure the electric shock. Uh, so, in the case of with the electrodes, the electrodes to apply on the heart, they were able to revive the electrical conductivity of the heart. At that time, it is unpleasant. It is an unpleasant stimulus we apply. But at the end of the day, we want to revive the heart. We want to pump some, we want to ensure that the electrical conductivity of the heart comes back to normal so that this person will survive and will not die from the heart emergency. So it is negative because it is not, it is not something that uh, is explained that it's not something that is good, but we have to do it in order to promote a behavior. Or it's about lateness or noise making. In the case of school children, we know that when children come to school late or they make noise in class, when we're all children, uh, they, they okay me. So tomorrow, you make sure you don't come to school late again, or you make sure that you don't talk in class again. So we want to promote quietness. We want to promote discipline. By promoting discipline, we apply a negative force or apply something that's unpleasant. So that's our call it negative reinforcement. So behaviorism, behaviorism involves negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement. So we've said that the positive reinforcement is to ensure that a behavior continues occurring by praising, by praising or by giving rewards. So you give rewards or you praise and the behavior will keep on occurring. Then in negative, in negative, we want the behavior to occur, but here we don't praise or we don't give a woman. We rather apply something that's unpleasant, and that makes it negative reinforcement. So that is the first one that behavior is. Now, the question that I want to ask you is under the negative reinforcement, 
One example I gave in your area is about beating on shelter at the woman during childbirth. But can we give other practical examples of negative reinforcement at your website? What are some of the other practical examples of negative reinforcement at your website? Yes, Portia, you have a Yeah. Yeah, sir, good morning. Yes, good morning. Yes, please. Um, I want to talk about the so the male involvement, even though it's a positive reinforcement, but yes. sometimes when you try to take care of those who came with their husbands, those who did not come with their husbands, they, sometimes they feel bad and they'll be murmuring. But then the next time you see that they also come with their husbands. So even though it's a positive, it's in a way a negative as well. So uh... It, it is important that it is not negative because it has promoted the occurrence of a behavior in a positive way. Yes, you are looking at it negative because uh, others, others, others you know, are not comfortable with it. But you see that at the end of the day, they themselves have also brought their own husbands. So we are looking at the point that it has promoted a good behavior in them, even those who are member right, has promoted a good behavior. But the, so the approach, the approach is that you have given preference. You have given preference. Hello, please. Sorry. It's possible because you are giving preference. You are giving preference or recognition to the behavior. And so after you, after you are giving the behavior, like you are giving the behavior of blessing. Please, please, let me see. But this is very serious, too. Please, we are sorry. If they, you start deducting 2020 20, 20, 20 marks, they will stop all this. All right, let's, 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 let's continue. That's fine. So, I've asked a question on the negative uh, reinforcement. That uh, can you get other examples, other practical examples that we can use on pleasant stimuli? Say, yes, um, um, please. Can you say admission, admitting a patient to the world like his, his or her freedom has been taken from him or something? Can you say it's a negative reinforcement? Admitting a patient to the world, and uh, the freedom will be taken away when you do false imprisonment. And I, I, I know I know you when we say false imprisonment at the world, we are looking at and so like false imprisonment, we are looking at the patient has been discharged, but after discharge, the patient cannot settle his or her bill. 
So you keep a patient in the world. No he or she is discharged until the bills are settled. So that one is false imprisonment. So yeah, that one is negative. It's negative, but you want to prevent uh, the patient from absconding. Uh, so if you want to prove, or you want to ensure that people don't run away with your bills. Uh, but the admission as a process itself. Uh, it's not imprisonment. Admission is to promote their well-being. So that's how it is. Uh, yes. Hello, sir. Yes, please. You can talk. Please. Um. Do we say that if the negative enforcement? Yes. With the with the negative reinforcement. Mm -hmm. at, the, at the end of the day, it brings positive reinforcement. It promotes a behavior, but it, it promotes it. We use a negative or we use an unpleasant way to promote a good behavior. Okay, then do we say that sometimes the, the client, who, some of them who comes to deliver, especially the primary, primary gravida. All right. When they are fully dilated, they refuse to bear down. So even if you tell them you want to give them episiotomy, they say no. So whenever you show them the scissors, you realize that the person will push at a go. So that okay. one will... Yes, so that, that, that is good. That is a good example. Uh -huh. That's a good example because... It's, it's negative, it's unpleasant, they don't like it, but it's to promote a positive outcome. So yes, it's correct, that is good. So Sir, it's an you example. Can... Yes, please, you can talk. Sir, please, um, when sometimes you'll be having ANC, a client comes and the HB is low, and then you see the the Go and buy um, blood tonics or any hematinic. Without the blood, you know, be the negative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello. Hello, sir. Yeah, your life's not too good. Oh. Yeah. So, Hello, sir. Please that... let me give an example. Sir, my hand is up. Okay. Hello, sir. Yes, uh, please, I'm yes. giving fundal pressure. Okay. Please, sometimes, um, um, some of the women, when you ask them to push, the woman, the baby's head has crowned, but because of the pain they feel, they don't want to push. So yes. some midwives give fundal pressure. So to okay. be able to push the baby out to prevent a... Uh, 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 how do I call it? Fit out bed, which can okay. even end up rupturing the uterus too. So, so the so the final, the final pressure, pressure is, is a negative reinforcement, but okay. in positive in bringing out a child so that the baby will not be dead. Yes. So the final pressure, the final pressure, is it painful? Yeah, you are contracting. Yes. So it's painful to a woman. Yes. All right, so if it's painful to a woman, then it is negative reinforcement. So that is an example of negative reinforcement. Yes, I can see Mary. Mary, how is that? Hello, sir. Yes, Mary. Uh, please, one example is when you are doing physical examination of the newborn. Okay. And you want the newborn to open the mouth, you tap the sole of the newborn so that the baby will cry. It's a pain, so it's a negative reinforcement. Okay, okay, okay. That, that, is, that, is, that is a good example. Yes. So the cry is okay. negative to the child, the cry is negative to the child, but it promotes a good medication. Yes. Okay. So you can 
play, you can type the rest in the comment box. You please, you type the rest in the comment box so that we can see. Okay. Okay. Yes, please. Sir, please, my, I want to know if it, if it's a negative reinforcement. Please, okay. can I? Okay. Speak? okay, that's fine. Please, can I speak? Okay, please, and you say. Uh huh. Uh, my firstborn. My husband okay. used to go to ANC with me. The first okay. time that we went, uh, the midwives, because they took care of us earlier, they started asking money from the man. Okay. So he decided not to go with me again. Is it negative reinforcement? So your husband decided not to go with you again? Yeah. For the subsequent cases? Yes. Uh, it is it is it is not a negative reinforcement. Hey, that is what I'm saying. I'm saying this is not a negative It is not a negative reinforcement uh, because what they are doing is negative. It's true. What they have done is not the best. It's negative. But it has not promoted. It has not promoted a good behavior in your hus husband. Oh. So it's negative, the act is negative, but it has not promoted a good behavior in your husband. Like that is to encourage him to come to a hospital. Uh, so the, the thing about negative reinforcement is that what you are giving is been negative. Like it should not be unple it should be unpleasant. But though it is unpleasant, it will lead to a positive outcome. Uh, so you are giving something that's unpleasant, unpleasant to the person, but to rather lead to a positive outcome. Uh, so that's how we, 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 we are looking at. All right. So thank you. Okay, sir. So thank you. You are welcome. So please, the objectives. Please, at our course objectives. These are the things I'm looking out for. How are you able to practically understand positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement and the behaviors? And so that if, if I want to ask you questions, then I will ask you questions based on some of these things. Uh, so if I give the practical example, then you identify why it is positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement. Uh, so please, let's uh, look at them. Again, now the second one is what the cognitive theory. Uh, there is noise, there is noise. Hey, can you Please. everybody mute all of us so that you give us permission to talk whenever they need us? If not, this is what they will be doing. We will not go anywhere. God, you know, go to watch and mute your mic. All right, I'll, I'll do that. All right. Okay. I've I've committed everybody. I've muted everybody, so let me see. So let's look at a second theory, which is about the cognitive theory. So we say that that one is for the Cognitivism. So the cognitivism is the cognitive theory, which is the second learning theory. And this theory has to do with the human brain. It has to do with how, how the learner 
process information in the brain and how the learner reacts to the information. So it's about select, selecting information. So you receive the information, you select what you want, then you leave others. So this cognitivism involves three processes. So the three processes are that first, the learner must receive an information. So we call it information acquisition. So first, the learner receives an information. Then secondly, the learner after receives the information will process it in the brain. So processing in the brain, the learner thinks about the information. And so the learner thinks about the information before responding to it. So the learner listen to information and then you process it and filter it. So process and filter, then you take out what you want and leave others. So the last thing is that after filtering, you now store the information on, in your memory. You permanently retain what you think is important and leave out what you don't want. So we are saying that the processes, the three processes involved in the cognitive theory is that first, a learner receives information, which is information acquisition. Secondly, the learner process the information in the brain. Then the last one is that you filter the information and you store what is important, what you need. The rest, you discard it in your brain. You don't store it. So we have to understand that the brain is an important information processor and that people process information based on what they think they like. It's based on their preferences. If you give an information and it is not pleasant to a person and the person don't want it, the person who, who might not even process the information. It will just be at the acquisition stage. So you give the information, yes. But the person will not process the information and saw it. So we will look at the practical application of this cognitive theory at our workplaces as midwives. So there is one gentleman who outlined nine steps of the cognitive theory. So we are going to look at these nine steps involved in the cognitive theory. So the gentleman is called Robert Gang. So Robert Gang proposed nine steps to describe into details how the cognitive theory works. And uh, it, is, it is one of our objective to understand these nine processes and how we can apply them practically at our workplaces. So are we, are we ready to go through the nine processes? Yes, sir. That's good. So on the board, the first process in the cognitive theory is all about reception. Receptive. And receptive means how do you gain the learner's attention? How do you receive the learner at the beginning to ensure that the learner pays attention to whatever information that you are coming to pass on? How do you prepare the learner to receive the information? So 
practically, we want to look at in terms of reception, how do you practically apply reception at all various places? How do you apply reception? Mm -hmm. Can I get an attempt? Can somebody attempt? How do we gain a learner's attention in, in giving education? Yes, Florence. Yes, Florence. Oh, okay, so um, mm. by before you can gain a learner's attention, meaning uh, it depends on the kind of rapport you create with the person. Okay. Uh huh. So the rapport will make you uh, gain the learner's attention very well. So in creating the rapport, meaning you make it um, so simple, like the person will be able to um, know whatever you are coming to say is actually necessary. Therefore, the need for the person to listen. And then you make the, the environment so uh, conducive for the person so that the person will not be agitative and sort of afraid. Hence, the person will be able to you'll be able to catch the person's attention. Thank you. All right, thank you. That is, that is great, thank you. Uh -huh. Shamira, what will you do? Yes, please, Shamira, come. So I first question to the learner. What is the question? When you ask question, maybe from the beginning, you start by asking questions. You are know that Okay, thank you. Doctor, yes, please. Doctor, hello, sir. Yes, please. And the sitting position that you position yourself, you will be nodding, okay. eye contact, and providing of privacy, all those things. And how, okay. if the if you ask the question. And you, how you explain or the feedback you give it, the person will tell the person that you are ready to like accept the person. All right. So, Hello, Ms. Sir. Ms. yes, please. Uh -huh. I think you also need to welcome them, person. Yes, welcome them. All right, that's fine. Then who signs up again? Okay, Susia. Or oh, Susia, then Beauty, yes. Mm -hmm. Beauty, are you there? Okay. Yes, Susie, Susie, please you can talk. Uh, you can also start when like you are you want to give a hot talk to audience okay. you can also get their attention by creating a simple joke okay or you tell a simple little story that they will all be attentive and listen to you then after that you proceed with whatever information you want to give them. Well, okay that, thank you that is good all right so please the the rest of the hands up maybe you can answer the second one then you inform the learner of the objectives and expectations. So we to be able to arouse the person's interest in whatever you are coming to say, you need to let the person understand the objective and expectations. So it's about the mind. So if the person gets to know that okay, we are coming to learn this. And at the end of the day, I'm, so, I'm expected to know A, B, C. Then you can also ask the person, oh, so what do you expect to also learn at the end of the day? Or what, what do you want to gain at the end of the day? So the expectations and the objective, they go hand in hand. You first look out for the expectation. Then you not come in with the objectives. So that based on that, you determine whether to listen to the information I want to give, to pay so much attention to it, or to just uh, ignore it, or listen, but 
the attention will be little. Because the learner needs to understand exactly the objectives and the expectations so that you help the learner to actually participate in the information that you are coming to give. It's about the mind. So the person should understand what is happening. Then you simulate the learner's record of previous or prior learning. It is it's called the retriever. So the retriever in every health education, before we give, we are always saying that don't be a master of everything. Remember that the person who is before you, the client before you, also has a lot of information about that same subject area. So you should understand that. So what you can do to help yourself is to first ask the client what he or she knows about the subject area. So that when you are coming to do it, just uh, have to know that you are coming to build on whatever the person already knows. Uh, the person already knows something, but based on what the person will say, then you build upon it with more scientific information. So it's good to retrieve their own knowledge about whatever education you are coming to give, then you build upon it. Uh, so you don't go and behave like you know everything and the person don't know anything. Uh, it, it is not that, it's not so. And if you agree with me that at our various health facilities, if you want to do health education, especially for people who have chronic or lifestyle diseases, either diabetes, or you can talk about maybe sickle cell disease, or you can talk about any other disease, hypertension and the rest, and they are managing them. Remember these people, because it's their condition, they have read a lot about it. So they know more about their own condition. So if they come and meet you and you are to offer them education, it is important for you to retrieve their knowledge and let them share with you what they know so that you can rather build upon it. If not, you may disgrace yourself if you want to get pretend as if they don't know anything and you are their master, you know everything, you may disgrace yourself. So it's important to do retrieval of the knowledge. So when you retrieve their knowledge and know what they know, then you now give them the information. So you now present the information. And that's what called selective perception. So the selective perception, we are looking at them in the retrieval process. When they retrieve the information and you know that, okay, they know maybe, they know their condition, they know their signs and symptoms, they even know the behavior modification, but then they don't know the treatment rationale. Then in selective perception, what we are saying is that you just concentrate on mostly what they are deficit in. Then you present more of the information on that. Uh, so it's not the entire topic that we are, you are going to waste your time and present the information on. But to make your way is that you just select, you select based on their retrieval process and keep the information on it. And because that's what they are looking out for. What they know already, when you are seeing it, they might not listen too much to you. But if you concentrate on select what they have been caught in, then it helps them to concentrate and to rather listen to you. So you present the information using the selective perception approach. After you have done your retrieval in the step three, then the step five, you guide the guidance to facilitate the learner's understanding. So go down the semantic encoding. So provide guidance. Now in providing the, the guidance, sometimes it is difficult for them to understand exactly the information you are giving them. So how do you provide guidance? You can provide guidance by breaking your information down, by using practical examples. 
So if, if you are educating on life modification and uh, you are mentioning scientific words or you are using their words, we are saying that they will not understand what. So avoid the use of their words. Provide practical examples, practical examples that they can relate to. And practical examples that they know. So let's take it that uh, you are at a rural setting and you are at a chips compound. And at this chips compound, you are educating on sources of protein. You are educating on sources of protein. And you educate on sources of protein. You mentioned that, oh, uh, you have to take face such a, such a tilapia, such a tilapia. When you go to a market, go and buy tilapia. It's good for you to get protein. So, yes, you have given information on how to get a protein. And you have mentioned tilapia in a rural setting, in a chef's compound. So, yes, tilapia is a way to get protein. But will the person understand that the person even know what tilapia is? And can they even get it in their markets? So, when we say provide a guidance, this is our message tilapia. Mention what the spark cover how they are setting. So, you are disturbing us. So, provide simple, practical information by providing guidance. Uh, so you don't you look at the locality and the information you give is should be context based something that they can relate to to understand exactly the information you are giving. So the the encoding is to help them in their mind to process the information to process the information. So if you give an information that they cannot relate to it, in their mind, they cannot process that information. So that's what a semantic encoding. In their mind, they need to be able to relate the information and understand it. So you need to bring it to their level as practical and as simple as possible. Then you have the learner demonstrate the information or skill. So responding. So after you have given your information, you are related to the context of the person and the person has now understood it. You have to test the understanding. So you may have to let them demonstrate the information or the skill that you are teaching them so that you will know that yes, they are actually on the same pace with you. They are responding to it and they are following exactly the information you are giving. Then to evaluate, to evaluate the information, you look for a feedback. So you give a feedback to the learner, reinforcement. So based on their demonstration of information, if they have left out something, or you want them to master a certain skill which they are yet to master, then you will reinforce it. That's you emphasize on it much so that they will know exactly the information that they are to take home at the end of the day. So when you are when you are sure that uh, you have given the information or it is a skill, you have taught them the skill and the information has been taken and you have given the feedback and you are assured of that, then you do retrieve back. And you do retriever. So the retriever, you can do it in other ways. So you can let a person come and demonstrate it at the retriever way. You can let the person, you can ask series of questions 
to see if the person understands the information. Uh, so anything you can do to retrieve the information you have given to the person to make sure that it goes on work. Then the last is that you work to enhance retention and transfer through application varied practice, generalization. So in generalization, what we can say is that you monitor, you monitor the information you are giving and ensure that the information is applied. The information is applied on daily basis in other lifestyle of the person. So these are the nice steps that the distinctive cognitive theory talks about. So now I want us to take a practical example and go through the nine steps. How can we apply the nine steps using a practical example at our website? How do we apply these nine steps? So I wish somebody to give us a scenario that we can go through each step one by one and see under each of the points, how do we do it practically using your scenario at your website? You can just give any scenario. Then we'll see how we can apply each of the steps that we have given. Ah, uh, yes, please, Anita. So, sorry, please, my is a question. I just need uh, the explanation on the feedback, okay. give feedback okay. to the learner and, and also, uh, the last point, where to enhance retention and transfer through, I didn't get this well, please. All right, all right. Okay. Thank you. So in the, the number seven, give feedback to the learner. That's reinforcement. Now in the reinforcement process, you have demonstrated a skill, let's say the number six. You have demonstrated a skill and the skill is about, let's say, hand washing. So effective hand washing. And you have demonstrated the skill of hand washing. And in the, after you have demonstrated, you also ask the person to wash the hand for you to see. Now, what would I say that in the process of the hand washing, when the person does it, when the person does it, you know the loopholes based on what you are giving, you know the loopholes. And based on the loopholes, you now tell the person the whole, you skip. Okay, so the feedback is that if you have to run four times and then the person runs three times, then you give a feedback that, oh, you, you did well, but uh, you were supposed to run four times, but you did three times. It's a feedback that you have given to the learner. So that feedback will reinforce the hand washing. And so the learner takes the feedback and knows that, oh, okay, then it is four times, not three times. Oh, okay. So, say, what's the difference nah. between the feedback okay. and the retrieval and the assessment of the learner performance, the retrieval and the feedback? Okay. What is the difference? All right. All right. All right. Now, in the, the feedback, that is one part that will give the feedback. Now, the other way is that feedback can be given during your education process or during your teaching process. Now, when you it is given during the teaching process, you can do the feedback. Now, the eight is assessing the learner's performance. So, in assessing the learner's performance, which is about retrieval, you can let the learner repeat the entire process. The entire process of hand washing from the beginning and now the entire process you are looking at you started with the how to prepare the environment you started with the requirements then you went to the hand washing itself so you have taught the person a whole process from beginning to the end 
So in the retrieval of the performance, you want the person to take it right from the beginning to the end. And you monitor the whole process and see how the person has performed based on all the steps of the hand washing process, right from setting up requirements and the rest. But in the, in the feedback that we talk about, in the process, in the process of only washing the hand, rubbing the hands, it's part of the process. It's not the whole process. So you can let the person also demonstrate. Okay, how many times, how many times did I demonstrate that you rub the hands? Then uh, you have done it three times. You have done it four times. The person said three times. They said, okay, you are doing well, but uh, do it four times again. So in the process of teaching, in the process of giving the information, you are also giving feedback as well. You don't do it till the end. So feedback can be given during the process of giving up the information. But in the number eight, assessing the learner's performance. You are looking at, at the end of the entire hand washing, right from setting up, right? The requirement, the requirement you need till you finish. The person takes the whole thing by him or herself alone. Then you can look at each of the various steps, how the person has actually performed. So basically, the feedback and the learners, the retriever, it's not that much of a difference. But the only difference you can give is that feedback can be elicited in each stage of the information process. Uh -huh. So in each stage, you can give a feedback. But for the learner's performance, you are looking at it at the end, at the end of the entire teaching or the entire process that you are performing. You are looking at it at the end of it, how the person can take it from A to Z. Yeah, but feedback can be given in between as you are going. You have not even finished, but you can be retrieving feedback before you finish. Are, are, are you getting somewhere? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Okay. Now, the, the generalization is that after you have got the person hand washing, you want to see when the person goes about normal daily activities, normal daily activities, that the person actually generalize or apply the hand washing process in other in other daily activities. So you are monitoring the person is about to eat food. Will the person do hand wash? So has the person apply your hand washing to eating food before you eat food, you have to wash hands. Hand washing is also applied uh, you have touched something that is contaminated. So you look at it. If the person has come into contact with a contaminated substance, after that, has the patient remembered to wash their hands as you have taught? Then you also look at when the person has used the washroom. After using the washroom, has the person remembered, has the person remembered to apply the hand wash that you have taught? Are you getting that point? So that's yes. the number. I yes, that the number. Allowed, have to go mm -hmm. yeah, in that case, like is it rooms? In that case, so is it questions or is it home visit? Or because you said you need to observe the person if she does. Yeah, that's well, well, she will tell you that the children you are saying the movement and they will call you at the police station. And the partner and for how do you do that? Okay. So, and um, let's look at it. So, depending on the facility or the unit you are in, depending on the unit you are in, you can do generalization of the information you have given at the unit if it is practical. So, let's look at it. If you are the AC unit, the labor unit, or the postnatal unit. And you have taught hand washing. You have taught hand washing. So in the postnatal unit, is it not possible to observe 
to see whether uh, hand washing they can generalize it to other activities that they undertake. Now we know that uh, in feeding, breastfeeding, breastfeeding, you can apply hand washing to breastfeeding practice. So if you are given an education on breastfeeding and you are given the education on hand washing, hand washing is an important thing. And you want them to apply hand washing during breastfeeding. So if it's at a unit, then you can observe at the postnatal, you can observe if the woman is about to feed, whether, he was, whether she washes the hand. I think you can observe that one. Or you can embark on what home visits. You can pay them visits in their houses to just observe whether I'm washing, they practice it in their homes. Ah, yes, so please, they are watching. Or based on the information you give, it can be generalized. You can get the application either at the units when they come to a facility. <laughs> Or some, of, or some of them, you may have to go do a home visit yeah. to be able to observe where it is being applied. Okay. Yes, Rebecca, your hand is up. Yes, sir. So I wanted to give the, the practical exa uh, example so that whether we can okay. use that one. Okay. Maybe okay. during education after discharge. All right. So we we gather them all mm -hmm. together by carrying their babies. Okay. So we ask them the we educate them. So previous some we ask them what they are those who have already delivered the experience they have. So they should tell us. Then we also add up. Mm -hmm. So so go on. <laughs> So I should use the nine models. Yes, would, yes whether it will fit or not. So okay, reception. With, the, with the reception, we welcome okay. them. Mm -hmm. We welcome them. So sometimes, okay. sometimes we also have a dummy that we give. We, we also carry to give them the education. So we show them the dummy, so okay. that their concentration will be on us. All right, and then. With the objective, so we ask them what, uh, since they delivered, what are they expecting after they deliver? So they are going to breastfeed their babies. They are going to eat well, how to bath their babies. Then with the retriever, so we okay. call them back. We call them back, like we ask them what they have learned. Go on. We ask them what they've learned to retrieve what they, uh, we have educated them. Then with the selective, we show them some pictures that they will look on it, and then we teach them the signs and symptoms. So we select some of the important areas about themselves and then the babies. Okay. Then to their understanding. Right. So, so as you are teaching them, five, as you are teaching them, how do you guide them to understand what you are teaching? How? Oh. Sir, please, I didn't hear that, please. And so I've said the number five. How do you guide okay. them to understand what you are teaching? So by guiding them, I show, that's why I show them the pictures. Victoria, so that they will also look at it and then they also tell me back what they are seeing or what I'm saying. Okay. Continue. With the responding, I ask them whether whatever we have said here, have they understood all? And then with some questions, if they also have some questions to ask. Continue. 
So with the reinforcement, that's number seven. Yes, we reinforce, so we encourage them, what we ask them or what we educated them or what they've all learned, whether they understand. So they should also talk back or tell us what we have learned after all. Then with the... So another retriever is here. Uh, because number three to retriever, I think I talk about that one, and the number eight. Yeah, the number three retriever is before you give the education. So before you give the education, there's retriever of their previous knowledge. Okay. okay. So with the one number eight... eight with the number eight retriever, I think you ask them to recall whatever we have learned. And then with the generalization, the education goes to all of them in general. That's what I can be able to say. Okay, that is your attempt. Uh, that is fine. That is, that is can fine. Can I try? You, do you want to base on their own or give a different one? A different one, I want to try. Okay, all right. So you, uh, let me just say something for one minute, then you come in. Are you okay? Now, in the, uh, I want you to understand that to apply this, you must take a specific topic. As a specific topic. So, for example, you, are, you talk about the education. Yes, education is broad. Uh, if you want to, if it's education, then you take a topic. What, what are you educated on? Like be specific. I want you to be specific with whatever you are saying. Just yes, select a specific topic. You are educating them on this. Then we will not take that specific topic and see how we can apply specifically. Uh, so that we'll get a specifics of whatever that we are doing. You are also teaching them a skill. You are also teaching them a skill. You are demonstrating a skill. And information that involves like still spectacular that skill that you are teaching them. Uh -huh. Okay, so please now you can come in. So sir, it means that with the Robert model is is pertaining to a specific topic. Yes, with the model, we, yes, it's uh, we want to look at a specific topic that you are actually describing. So what I mean that the first example she gave here yes, is true. It's about education, but if it was general, like I cannot identify specifically what you are educating them. So for example, if you are educating on the, uh, let's say diabetic patients who are being discharged, fine. So tell me that you are giving education on diabetic patients on discharge. Uh, so yes, yeah, diabetic patient, they are going home, they have been discharged. So I know that specifically the education is on diabetic patient. If you are so like if you are also giving education on let's say the hand washing, I've given hand washing, it's a specific education you are going to give. You are educating on contraceptives. Uh, so contraceptives is also a specific thing. So like I want you to make it more specific, uh, like make it more specific. Okay, so please you can go. Okay, so this one is on family planning counseling. Okay, family planning counseling. So with the reception, I need to. I will introduce myself. All right. Mommy, you are you are welcome. My name is Madam Equia. I'm the maid. Uh, maid by all. I am the next. I will take care of you today. So feel free. Tell me anything you want to say. Ask any question you want to ask. I am here to help you. So you create a rapport so that the learner will feel at home. You, you make her uh, sit down comfortably. Then you also sit by her, by facing her. So with that introduction, the learner will feel at ease. Because sometimes when they see us wearing our uniforms and all that with our belts and spectacle, when they see us, like they have some kind of fear. So when you are able to interact with her in that manner, the reception that you give 
speak to their clients, make their clients feel at ease. And with the ex, uh, expectancy, to inform the learner about the objectives. <laughs> Ah. okay continue okay sorry so you tell the client the objectives and the expectations that you expect that by the end of your discussion what you expect you expect that uh, the clients know what family planning is all about mm-hmm. I need to continue. So you are family planning. What do you know about family planning? So you assess the knowledge of the client to know the level, the misconceptions of family planning she has in mind, then you put in corrections. So when you get to know the, uh, the knowledge Knowledge of the clients, you know where to tackle because there are some clients that are privileged and they think you are the boss and you want to bring in big, big words, they can disgrace you. So you assess the knowledge of the clients, then uh, you, you feel in, you know where to tackle. That is for the uh, retrieval of knowledge. Then selective perception. So when you, you assess the client and you know the knowledge that you, you assess the knowledge of the client and you know, you know exactly what the client wants. Maybe you say, okay, what do you, oh, yeah, which okay. one do you want to do? What do you know about family planning? So, oh, I know family planning is this, this, that, and that. And I want to do the three months one, or I want to do the five years one. So when you, the client tells you exactly what she wants, then you focus on that, you emphasize on that, the selective perception. The present information at hand, you emphasize on that. You don't need to be... around the okay. bush, talk about, sorry to say, unnecessary clients will listen to you. Then providing guidance. In the providing gui- a guidance, you okay. have to break the information down using practical examples. You need to avoid using jargons. That is not where you are going to say big, big, big words that a client doesn't understand because initially you have already assessed the client's knowledge and you know the level of her intelligence. So you come to her level, you don't use jargons, you come to her level so that the client will understand you. That is where we were saying the semantic encoding so that you, you, uh, you come down to the client level for the client to understand you. And when uh, in uh, having a uh, giving feedback, I think that is where we are all. Oh. And have the learner demonstrate the information or skill. So you can tell the client that what, um, to demonstrate uh, what you said, you can also tell the client to do that. And also giving feedback is not all about what you said. You can ask the client, what did that say family planning was? You can explain that to you. What was some of the misconceptions? So if she's able to say about three or four, then you add up, you fill in the gaps. In feedback, you need to fill in the gaps. So if, it's, if you, you said about two or three, or she didn't say it well, then you, you correct it rather. Oh, mommy, no, no. Then retrieval. <laughs> Sorry. Then assess the learner performance retrieval. That is what you said from A to Z. Everything you said about your counseling, you let a client say everything to you on the family planning person that you have done. And that is the retrieval of the learner's performance. And that will tell you that all what you tell the client, you Hello. 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 Yes. Oh, she's off. 
Okay, so uh, yeah, that, that's a specific practical example uh, demonstrating the, the steps. Uh, so I think uh, that is exactly what I want us to do. Yes, look at it, a specific example, then you can just go through the processes and know how it applies. Okay. Uh, so in the application, we can use a. Now we open again. Ma, that's why you want to know how to do it. Ma, now. All right. Can sign it in a channel. Ah, one kind of person too. So there are other examples, applications of the connected theory. Uh, so. Oh, sorry. Oh. So uh, okay. my network took me out. <laughs> uh, you have on the last one. Are you are you okay now? Yes, sir. My network took me out. Sorry. Okay, you are on the last point. Yeah, so sir, with the generalization, that is why you said uh you want to see in the normal day activities of the clients. Does the clients yes. perform or apply all this uh this uh family planning issues? Does the maybe does she educate because you have corrected some misconceptions? Do they educate other people that uh, whatever they are saying outside of our family plan is not true? Sometimes when you assess their knowledge, they can tell you, or even in a, a, a health talk, you can assess their knowledge and see that if their misconceptions have been corrected. So that is how I, I understand it. Thank you. So thank you. Uh... So practically, uh, this is what I want us to do. We take a specific topic and then we go through the nine steps. Now in the practical application, maybe let's look at this, it can help you. You, you think about social and behavioral change or the health belief model. So it's, uh, you look at the social and the evaluating model or the health belief model as practical applications. So these models, they are looking at uh, how we can provide information to change the behavior of human beings. So the example that the uh, master that's gave, and that would be anyone. Hey, so the example my sister gave on farm planning. The farm planning falls under social and behavioral change, or it's a health belief model. We can change the health beliefs of people towards the uptake of our various health services. So specific examples, we can look at exercise programs for breast cancer patients. So that is a specific topic that I can take. Then, I can go through the NAM process and see how will I apply the NAM process to this exercise program. So I want to teach the breast cancer patients on exercise programs. So how will I go through the NAM processes? Or you look at treatment, you look at treatment. Uh, that is unpleasant. Nobody likes to be breathed. But you look at it, if how do you go about the brief or the, 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 the coping process in brief? You can look at the nine processes. How will you help people to deal with it? And you see different between people. Or you have to deal with adolescent depression in girls. How do you educate adolescent girls who are depressed? using the nine steps or diabetic counseling and treatment. So diabetic education, how do you go about it? Or ARTs, antiretroviral treatment. How can you use the nine steps to offer education on antiretroviral treatment and then demonstrations for your clients? So these are all practical topics 
strike up topics that you can pick. And then you can look at the nine processes and now describe into detail under each of the process. What are you going to do if you are to do diabetic counseling? What are you going to do if you are to do ART counseling? And so the good thing that you understand how to take each of these and how to apply the nine processes to them. What we would do specifically if we take each of these topics. Then our time is almost up. So finally, let's look at the last one, the, con the constructivism. So the constructivism is about how to generate knowledge. And so in learning, we have a principle that says that the learner can generate knowledge on his or her own, or the learner can discover knowledge on his or her own through your engagement with the world. So this principle tells you that everybody, yeah, everybody has a tendency to discover new information if you interact with the world. And based on the information you have received, you can come up with your own ideas and principles about your interaction with people. So it's about previous experience. You already have your previous experience. You already have your own views about life. But when you interact with people, when you interact with the environment and more, and you are exposed, you are exposed to different environments, then you are able to construct new and understanding of issues. I remember they, they always say that exposure helps you to understand things better and it helps you to refine your knowledge. So whatever you already know, when you are exposed to a different environment, you are able to rethink and restructure your own philosophies and ideas in life. So the constructivism tells you that every human being can develop and or can discover knowledge on his or her own. So the human being is not an empty vessel. I... <laughs> Uh, but so the being, it's not an empty person. Mm -hmm. But the human being can discover the nature of this. Mm -hmm. so, this no man. Man. so this is a constructivism theory that you can construct your own knowledge, you can give your own perception and develop new ideas when you interact with the world, when you are exposed to the world in several ways. And so uh, in the case of the education on maybe farmer planning, people have their own views, people have their own experience of farm planning. But when they come into contact with you as a health personnel and you give them certain information, you build upon their understanding, you realize that they will change their perception about farmer planning. So that they will reconstruct new knowledge about farmer planning. So that's what the children say. Uh, so we'll end our lesson here today so that you could know the next lecture. So please, from here, uh, I'll make sure that you get a slice of what we have done today. So in all, we have looked at the three, the three theories of learning. So behaviorism, cognitivism, and constructivism. So we have looked at how to explain each of them and the practical examples that we can cite under each of them. Then we have looked at the cognitive theory, how to apply the nine principles. And so I will, there's an assignment I've already given. From here, I'll give you the assignment so that the, the assignment is for three weeks. So you, you get the assignment, it's for three weeks. And the three weeks is that you take a topic, a topic, and use the nine steps of the cognitive theory to deal with that particular topic. So all the nine steps we have gone through, you just take one particular topic, either at the ANC, at the labor, or at the uh, postnatal. Then you tell me this, the topics. You describe it using the nine steps into detail, specifics. At my first target with the family planning. So the assignment is going to be for nine, eight, three weeks. 
So you will get. Yeah, please come assignment. again. I'm going, give, I'm going to give you an assignment for three weeks, which is on the book. I'll give it to you. It's already it's ready. So I'll just share it to you after this. So you have to use the nine principles of the cognitive theory and how to apply them. You just pick a topic, a specific topic, and then you apply all the nine principles. It's for three weeks, an assignment for three weeks. So thank you for, for your cooperation and thank you for joining the class. Let's continue to learn. Yes, I am Bella. Our time is up. What do you want to say? Please, I am Bella. Pass one. Please, uh, um, I wanted to ask you, how can we get the recording to? Because I heard you talking of the slides, but you didn't comment on, this, uh, on the recording. Yes, the, the, the recording, the, uh, it will give it to you, please. Yes, we'll, we'll make sure that you get it, please. Uh, so we'll attend to that. Thank you for your patience, sir. All right, you are welcome. So have, have a good day. Same yeah. to you. God bless, God bless you. you.